Welcome okay, everyone. I'll just wait for everyone to uh, to join. We'll slowly see the attendees drip in. I'll give it a minute. people dripping in so give it a few seconds and I'll start welcome everyone all right so uh, welcome everyone well, and good afternoon good morning uh, good evening wherever you are in the world um, to this uh, webinar hosted by the uh, Payments and Cards Network. Um, and um, before I give the floor over to Matthijs Korn, I wanted to give a bit of introduction on, uh, on us. For those of you who don't know us, uh, Payments and Cards Network is a uh, head centric agency uh, specialized on uh, the fintech space across Europe, uh, US and APAC with offices in Amsterdam, Berlin, Atlanta and Singapore. Uh, on top of this, we try to add value uh, to the fintech industry by um, hosting our weekly fintech uh, podcast, podcast called In Check with Fintech. We have a quarterly magazine. Uh, we have a news platform um, as well as these, uh, these webinars. Um, if you want any further information on us, uh, please visit our website, www.teampcn.com. Um, so without further ado, I'll uh, give the floor to Matthijs. Matthijs is a business development manager at uh, FSS. He's a payments connoisseur and an enthusiast. Um, and I think he's truly the best guy uh, to host this webinar about uh, card and payment opportunities during this pandemic. Uh, a little bit of a teaser, if you're interested, um, we've also talked about card and payment opportunities with Matthijs um, in um, one of the uh, FinTech uh, podcasts. Matthijs, the floor is yours. Yeah, th thank you very much, Rogi. Thank you very much for the kind words in terms of, uh, of, of, of introduction. So uh, today we're going to talk about the card and payments opportunity during a pandemic. I'm joined by a uh, second to none uh, world-class set of panelists who I'll introduce while uh, trying to launch the poll. Um, and we're going to ask you what type of organization you'll represent. And if you would like to vote during the, uh, while I introduce the panelists, I've launched the poll. So I'm joined today by Michel Drupstein, who is the head of mobile at ING, responsible for uh, everything to do with mobile with, within ING on the retail and the commercial side, so the, the B2B bank in the various countries that ING is active in. I'm joined by Matt Griffin, who is the head of key accounts at Nets, a um, large pan-European processor with Scandinavian roots. I'm joined by Paul van Alphen, airline payment expert and founder at Up in the Air Payments Consultancy. I'm joined by Angus Burrell, who is the Senior Vice President of Retail at Emergent Pay, a uh, acquirer and will hear today an issuer with roots in Eastern Europe and a large presence across Europe. And last but certainly not least, I'm, I'm joined by Narendra Nandal, the Head of Issuing um, at FSS based in Dubai. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Great to have you uh, on, the, uh, on the webinar today. We have a set of questions that we'll go through and um, I've just looked at the poll. We have 11% representing an issuer, 10% from an acquirer and 78% from other. So I'm actually very <laughs> curious to hear what, what is other. I had not quite expected uh, that's cute, but that's interesting. Um, thanks very much for voting, everybody. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take it away if I can close the poll. There we go. 
All right, so the first question is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Any observations to share and anything specific to um, in new innovations? Has, has innovation stopped during the pandemic? I think, Michel, I think you have some interesting insights on, uh, on that. Yeah, thank you, Matthijs. Uh, maybe we have a couple of insights that, that we would like to share uh, indeed. Maybe one of the most peculiar insights is that the average uh, ticket size, so the bill for visiting a hairdresser, uh, went up from 35 to 40 euros in uh, the Netherlands prior and after the lockdown. Uh, so that was one of the insights that we, we measured among uh, the spending of our customers. Uh, but of course, we, we see uh, a number of other things as, uh, as well. I think you can divide them in uh, two or three things. Of course, uh, during, uh, during the lockdown, uh, people want less contact, eh, fearing uh, any virus uh, spread, etc. Uh, so less contact means uh, in a number of markets, in uh, multiple markets, contactless. So in several markets, we saw a huge increase, uh, a couple of percents indeed, or even more uh, in three months' time, uh, increasing contactless, uh, contactless payments. Uh, so I think that's that's in general for the for all of our retail markets where we saw that uh, that effect. Uh, the, the second one clearly is if if there is a need uh, by our consumers of less contact, there are also other solutions uh, available uh, beyond contactless, and uh, that uh, has much to do with the use of the smartphone. So you could imagine indeed uh, use cases and, and payment solutions where there is no contact at all, no contactless but even less contact by dropping a package at the door and I finalize my, my transaction uh, on my own smartphone without ever, uh, ever tapping or touching uh, anything. Um, and, and lastly, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's about uh, cash. Uh, I think uh, the, the increase in expenditure on, on contactless uh, had a lot to do with the reduce of, uh, of cash spending in, uh, in shops. Uh, we do see their um, uh, graphs heading up again in, in terms of uh, usage of, uh, of cash, but we clearly believe that the, uh, the pandemic will be uh, a catalyst for uh, a, a faster uh, reducing of, of cash usage uh, in the coming months and certainly years. So we're, we're increasing there the, the pace of uh, uh, less cash uh, without being cashless, uh, of course. That will take a while before countries are, are cashless. And, and, and any observations, Michel, on the form factor physical card versus mobile? Yeah, uh, clearly. So, um, as, as I said, indeed, uh, contactless is, is uh, I think, uh, the form factor that uh, most of us or all of us know, and uh, that, that's really a mature product already in, in all of our markets. We also see in some of our markets, but we're also busy in, in uh, better measuring uh, that, uh, the use of, uh, uh, of smartphones. Uh, as you know, uh, paying contactless in shops, you can do with your card or you can do with your uh, phone. In some of our markets, we saw a clear increase as well uh, of customers that uh, only use their mobile phone instead of their, their plastic card. And so what we call uh, mobile only uh, customers. Majority of customers is using both the card and the mobile, but we see uh, a, uh, a relevant increase there in uh, people and customers that only use their mobile for doing in-store uh, transactions. And I, I think that will, uh, this, this pandemic, which of course has all kinds of downsides, uh, obviously, but yeah, it's, it's, it's also a catalyst indeed to uh, create the additional awareness on how digital can be used and uh, let people get used to it uh, uh, indeed. We, we don't have evidence on that, but we clearly believe that certainly in online spending, there were uh, a lot of uh, first time users, especially in the 50 or 60 plus uh, age group, uh, a number of uh, customers that uh, did their first online transaction. Uh, wow. That's also of, uh, of value. Yeah, incredible. But Narendra, anything fr from your perspective in terms of uh, infrastructure and systems? So, so uh, 
just to quickly uh, also summarize what Michelle was saying, you know, I'm seeing three big trends which are happening during this pandemic. One is obviously the whole consumer behavior is changing from uh, contact uh, cards to contactless cards. Uh, and that is giving rise to a huge amount of change at the back end. And you have to kind of to enable the consumers to start going and doing these transactions at the, at the, at the merchant's place. So at the back end, the whole uh, uh, tokenization is up on the rise. The, uh, the how do you kind of provision the cards, the, the contact cards into a contactless format so that people can go and do the transactions. So at the back end, the infrastructure is gearing up to kind of you know, start enabling these kind of transactions. The second thing as well, and what also Michelle was uh, kind of uh, adhering to was, you know, there are newer categories which are coming up. Like for example, uh, more and more people, more and more older people are doing the transactions for the first time. The form factor is changing from uh, a card to a mobile form factor who then are going and doing the transactions on the, on the, uh, the, the merchants themselves are going from the offline to the online space. Uh, so a lot of, lot of momentum is kind of getting uh, shifted towards the digitization and at the back end to enable these uh, processors like FSS or uh, companies or the technology providers like FSS are gearing up to enable these transactions uh, for, for the end consumers and the end uh, merchants. Uh, another thing which I'm kind of seeing uh, uh, the trend in the last six months uh, during this pandemic season is uh, since most of the merchants, they are not able to take on the whole uh, cost of technology onto themselves. So there are a lot of partnerships which are happening. So uh, the schemes are coming along with the merchants, the, on the both on the issuing and the acquiring side, and they are enabling uh, partnerships. So for example, uh, you know, like uh, even a lot of, lot of uh, retail merchants, like large retail merchants uh, who have who have interest on the retail shops and uh, giving different kind of services are partnering with the loyalty guys are partnering with the payments guys are partnering with the uh, end uh, merchants right so together the whole ecosystem is coming together and partnerships is the new uh, form factor which is coming up uh, which is giving rise to uh, something like open banking uh, systems super apps and that is where the world is moving towards and how payments are becoming more and more backend uh, in the sense they are becoming more frictionless, more uh, just pass through mechanisms. Uh, that's, that's where the trends are heading towards. Uh, the, in fact, like industries uh, where we are seeing, uh, you know, there's a drop off um, uh, which are most affected by this pandemic, like the travel industry or the, or the uh, hotel or the hospitality industry, even those uh, indices are kind of innovating uh, to attract customers. Uh, you know, like in the in the in the normal uh, fall of business, the, these industries and uh, maybe Paul can add, uh, you know, like uh, more views on this because he's been into this industry. How they are innovating into uh, enabling payments and cards. Maybe it's good to to add some Matthias that. Uh, the, the trend there, uh, you asked the question about form factor. Uh, we, we're a clear believer in, in, in the mobile phone, like, like most of the parties, obviously, but we really saw that uh, that the change in trends and the acceleration of behavior, mobile behavior, starting uh, in 2019 uh, already. And uh, the, the pandemic, uh, during the lockdown, obviously, you see some, some uh, declining transactions but we really think that this will be an accelerator for, for a faster pace to, to go digital and to uh, get our customers uh, getting used to, to digital. Yeah, and, and I think a mobile first uh, strategy. And, and Narendra mentioned partnerships. I think Michel recently, ING also launched a uh, token, um, I don't know if pilot is the right word or if it's, if it's already a product. Uh, yeah. with, with a large retail, but, but very much in partnership. 
Yeah, but it, it, it's uh, well, a, a couple of things. So we, we are a clear believer and, uh, and Narendra indeed mentioned that. I, I think the need for, for partnerships and uh, working together, co-creation is only getting uh, bigger. We see a clear need and demand from our business customers, uh, merchants uh, indeed, who are in need uh, of, uh, of some help and some assistance uh, in, indeed to, to, be, uh, to be helped in, okay, what kind of customer journeys do we have? How can we improve uh, things? Last year, we did some small experiments there uh, with a uh, large retailer, a uh, large supermarket uh, indeed. Uh, on a self-checkout, a kind of digital store. So no employees, no cash register, uh, using your uh, contactless card to check in, to do the shopping, and you walk out with all kind of other technologies that was provided by, uh, by that supermarket. Uh, recently, we announced there the pilots that we will uh, start uh, coming quarter, so in Q4, together with, with Albert Heijn. Uh, and that is indeed based on tokenization uh, technology. Uh, scheme tokenization uh, to be precise on that uh, one uh, because we believe that that's one of the technical enablers to to create and shape uh, new customer journeys or to enhance some existing customer journeys uh, either online or uh, or in store definitely so uh, tokenization is uh, is one of the key technologies that we're uh, aiming for that we're already working on of course with with solutions that we have in place uh, whether it's paying with your wearables or google pay apple pay or paying with your ing app in the uh, in the shop so it's, a, it's an it's an underlying and very important uh, fundament indeed to to create all kinds of new uh, use cases and to support multiple form factors uh, there as well yeah, the, uh, exactly and the, the, that's an interesting bridge and I'm going to come back to the travel in the, in the next question, but I think this is an interesting bridge, I think, to both Matt and, and Angus. Uh, from an issuing perspective, we see people using their cards. We see it's, it's very interesting to hear that 50, 60-year-old uh, doing their first online transaction. I'm actually a little bit baffled by that age, uh, not having done online uh, transactions. Um, but I guess there's a learning point here for, for everybody. But... Um, and, and I think particularly Angus, coming from the acquiring world, is issuing now the new competitive field. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, yeah, good question. I think, I mean, we are, um, we're an acquirer on one side, as you know. We're also a, um, a payment gateway. We operate all sorts of, uh, all manner of uh, alternative payment methods and mechanisms internationally. Um, we are uh, an e-money license holder and an issuer, so we're, um, I guess getting going in that space and I'll, and I'll come on to a, a few um, areas on that in a minute if I may but I think um, it, well I mean the, the, I'm surprised as well about the uh, adoption of mobile by um, by sort of 60 year olds I know that my mother still writes me a check now and then but I think she's pretty extraordinary in that way and I'm simply pleased that I'm able to um, cash my checks in using my mobile because otherwise I'd be going to the bank um, but, but that, so I think things have moved forward uh, a lot in that sense in, in terms of um, acceptance and issuing I think they're hugely hugely complementary um, and to, to the sort of previous question as it were I'm finding that there's a, a great interest in um, businesses for being able to uh, issue cards and use companies like us to issue cards for them to be able to uh, pay employees. Um, the, the ability to make really, really quick, seamless payments across and have visibility of what's going on between those accounts is really, really key there. And I think there's, you know, I think there will be, uh, you know, whether it's going to be immediate, whether it'll be over the next two or three years. Um, perhaps things will be, be held up by, uh, by COVID, perhaps they'll be speeded up by COVID, but I think there will be a change in the way that, um, in the way that we are paid as individuals by our businesses over the next uh, decade without question. I think it'll be much uh, faster, quicker, more seamless, and just instant payments. It won't, might not necessarily be monthly. Um, you know, the, the, the systems we have available are changing and that's, that's where we um, are able to help there. There's also, um, you know, large brands are looking at issuing cards. Um, it's already started with some brands across Europe, but large brands 
issuing cards you know those of us uh, on the call and those listening who are in payments will know that there's a huge advantage to be able to issue a card which means that you get a, a nice little share of that interchange um so you know that that also uh, I think I mentioned uh, to the panel when we spoke a couple of days ago, there are a number of charities who uh, are looking at the ability to issue cards to their donators or donors, whether they be giving 10 euros a month or 10,000 euros, you know, they can still get money back in from that spend and see that as a way to keep that consumer um, loyal to their brand. And I think it really, for me, everything, my, my core uh, business. What I love is is uh, UX, is understanding the consumer. And I think that to a certain degree in payments, we tend to go a little bit too far and we tend to um, try and force things on the consumer that they're not ready for. Um, on, and I think we really need to learn and listen to, to what the consumer is doing. I mean, I noticed one question um, on the list there, which is asking about um, the change from contact to contactless and how that's going to uh, survive in physical stores, we're actually interestingly looking at uh, ways of uh, securely being able to enable consumers to make payment in store without touching any device other than their own smartphone, which they will be comfortable with. They know where it's been, hopefully. Um, so they're not concerned about lots of other people having touched that. So I think for me, uh, issuing uh, and, and card acceptance, they go hand in hand uh, and we uh, play a huge part and will increasingly play a big part in um, usability for consumers and understanding what the consumer wants to do with their, their speed of adoption and how they want to uh, be able to make a payment as well as enabling those payments out uh, giving giving brands and, and businesses the ability to issue cards um, to make life easier for consumers ultimately yeah. it's, it's good to mention that uh, of course we most of us uh, well at least let me speak for myself are payment nerds uh, indeed well that's it yeah <laughs> There's also a level of, of what our customers and consumers in general can, can handle. Eh? Uh, we, we think that uh, we, we, can, we can throw a number of innovations on the, uh, on the market, but there's only so much that uh, a, a consumer can handle, handle and is willing to change its existing uh, behavior. Uh, we, we, uh, as ING did a, recently a survey indeed about the willingness of consumers to, to extend or to have more uh, payment uh, options. Well, there, there are clearly some uh, psychological factors that play a role there in what a consumer can uh, can handle. There's only so much different payment methods that a consumer can uh, can choose. And for sure, there will be much more payment methods on the market than, uh, than consumers can uh, can handle. Uh, and, and there will certainly be a shakeout in the coming years as, uh, as well. Uh, I think um, just, just adding to that, I was looking yesterday that uh, it, it can be a long road to be an overnight success so we're all talking about contactless i mean i, I remember uh the, the first contactless payment in the uk on an emv card was in 2007 so we whilst it's flavor of the month now and the mainstream press are, are highlighting the health benefits and all of that it's it's uh, the adoption has been steady and slow and, and i think there are tremendous opportunities with things like open banking and the convergence of different payment rails and I like what Angus said around the fact that I think a lot of the people on this call and companies we work for are in a great position to help people who the barriers to to offer payments to their customer previously were just too high and too expensive I think that's coming right down and that um, payments will become an extension of the customer experience in a different sphere it will stop being uh, its own kind of uh, isolated island where banking is something that people know they have to do and just be more absorbed and embedded into what like uber is i guess that's the the genius of that they the, they took the payment and the the waiting for the taxi and made it just seem like part of the the journey so i think uh that, that's where i think we we will start to see things um uh, develop and and the what's happened during the pandemic has really accelerated a lot of things that we already held to be true. So the focus on UX, the automation need for that and uh, artificial intelligence uh, firming up some of the back end of things. I think, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, so one, of the, one of the questions that came in and is, is Matt, and, and you kind of alluded to that a little bit is, are Visa and MasterCard or, or are the card schemes under threat? 
uh, by all these developments? Uh, I mean, it, uh, it'd be great on one of these things to be really controversial. Say, yes, they are dead. You will not hear of them. But it, I mean, the, <laughs> Visa and Mastercard are two of the wealthiest companies in the world, and they they have known for some time that the traditional Visa and Mastercard rails are, whilst they have tremendous value and, and longevity, they've been investing in other. I mean, uh, look at Net. They've, uh, Mastercard is is uh, investing in our account-to-account uh, -account payment piece. Uh, they bought Vocalink. Uh, Visa have, uh, have made uh, significant investments in um, instalment lending and things. Like that. I think that their their businesses will shift, but their um, their existing business will take a long time to to truly fail off. And that they are well they are m making many bets in many markets on the future. So. I don't think we need to worry for Visa or Mastercard. What was really interesting yeah, just, just to add, sorry. you said yeah, just, earlier. Just to, add what Matt, just to add what Matt was saying, you know, like uh, Visa and Mastercard might have started as card companies, but they are more of uh, a, a network company. And uh, Mastercard's acquisition of Vocalink and Visa's uh, acquisition in some of the other companies uh, is a is a way forward where you know at the end of the day they connect the issuers and acquirers and the members. Uh, they enable the payment rails. Uh, so they, they are here to stay. It's not that uh, these companies would uh, kind of you know, fold up. They are here to stay. The business models will change. Uh, the payment flows will change uh, from a pull-based card uh, system. It will be more uh, towards uh, push systems, uh, like what Nets is into, the account-based uh, payments. So, you know, so the shifts will happen in the business models. At the end of the day, what gives convenience to the consumers uh, and how the consumers will go and do the transaction is where the focus would be. Uh, and that's where we are seeing most of the shifts. And as what Matt was saying earlier, you know, like uh, it, it took about like seven odd years or 10 odd years for the contactless has been there, right? But the COVID situation impact has changed the whole consumer behavior. And what I was, uh, I was in a call with, with uh, some of my visa colleagues and they were saying, you know, like uh, three out of four, literally 75% of the people are now moving towards contactless. So that's, that's where the trends are. And uh, we have to, as technology companies at the back end, we have to basically enable and uh, give the technologies out both on the issuing and acquiring side. Uh, and obviously as wrappers on the recon as, uh, as well as fraud management side to enable these transactions. Uh, and maybe, you know, like payments uh, would keep on evolving and uh, you know, like more and more Uberification of the payments will happen. I think it's down to trust from the consumer as well, isn't it really? I mean, I think uh, that the, the whole thing about, you know, Visa, I go back to my, the, the poor example, she'd hate me talking about her, my mother, but you know, she knows, she, she, she knows, or she believes she knows what Visa is and what MasterCard is, and it's a brand she trusts, you know, and, and it's the same with um, many, many consumers, although with, um, you know, um, millennials and Generation Z, that's changing, but we, you know, I, still bank with HSBC. I, I you know, I've, I've got so many other bank accounts, I almost can't tell you. And that's because like you, Michael, I'm a bit of a payments geek and I'm interested in how they work and, and, and the UX and, and what that can do for me. But I still, my main bank is HSBC. And that's been the case since I was probably 15. And I think across Europe, the majority of people still operate in that way. And along with that, Visa and MasterCard are brands which are trusted. The consumer believes that their funds are, are secure and that if anything goes wrong or if their card is stolen, they're protected in some way uh, with that. So I think it'll take a, a, a little bit to change that. And I think open banking is, is making a massive, massive difference. And the likes of uh, a, a lot of the, um, you know, certainly on the issuing side, whether we're talking about physical card or account, uh, a lot of the challenger banks, the, the um, N26s, the, the Monzos, Starling, um, Revolut, etc. When, when it starts to come into open banking and you can see all of your accounts at all different, um, from all different banks and financial institutions and maybe some, some lending you've got in place and some funds which you owe all in one place, for a consumer it's all about convenience. And, and it's now about what they can do from their mobile device and almost nothing more. Uh, and, and as long as it, there's an app for it on um, on iOS or on uh, on Android, then they're probably going to trust that it's usable and wait until something goes wrong because it's so easy to to make use of. So so sk skipping to uh, to travel, Paul, 
you, you've been very quiet, um, but we alluded to uh, w w some verticals have been hit more than others. I think travel and particularly airlines has been hit very, very hard. How has that industry coped with the reversal of incoming flows to practically overnight moving to a kind of a refund environment? Yeah, good afternoon. The, um, yeah, I think first of all, the, if you look at um, customer behavior, let's say moving forward, definitely there will be impact. Um, but bear in mind that travel, but also like events and, and, and uh, festivals and, and concerts, that kind of stuff, you pay in advance. So uh, easily a couple months to, you know, booking in, let's say January for departure, during the spring or in the summer and that happened already this year as well so when covid hit um as let's say mid-march and end of march uh the borders started closing and airlines started to cancel uh flights then all of a sudden the 95 percent of the flow reversed that meant that everything that was already uh, paid for and in most cases already remitted to uh, the airlines or the travel agencies or the tour operators. Um, flights got canceled and the, uh, the tour operators, the, the travel agencies, the airlines all start to be very worried about their cash flow. Um, they um, had to go into kind of a refund, refund mode and it's okay, how can we, first of all, get that operationally organized with, with their staff being furloughed and all of a sudden seeing like 10, 20, 30 times more refunds than usually. Um, they really had to adapt to that. And um, the, the airlines, for instance, started to issue vouchers for a future use, sometimes with some uh, form of a bonus on top of it to, uh, to, 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 to at least make it more uh, like an incentive to, to, to more make it more acceptable for customers to leave their money with the airline or with the travel agency or tour operator and then uh, book at a later stage. Well, fast forward six months, um, um, we've seen delays in refunds three, four months, a lot of customers obviously were affected by that. Uh, they, had, they needed that money very, uh, you know, that was very much needed for, for other uh, expenses and people got like laid off, stuff like that. So it, it was quite a, it is still, but it was definitely uh, earlier this year, a very, very difficult situation for the industry. It's, uh, and the outlook is, is still very, very, very difficult, by the way. Um, if you look at um, forward bookings, um, then, yeah, you'll see also that 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 um, the behavior will change. You know, we were talked about already uh, uh, contactless, or at least I see a, a boost coming from you know the face to face payments using your uh, you know your 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 card in a in a mobile um, a wallet like an Apple Pay, for instance. And that has become way more uh, more uh, more common. And I think one important aspect with these kind of prepayments is that um, um, you know. If it's a if it's a long waiting for a refund, if it's the the, the risk of, a, of of a supplier going out of business and then uh, you know, being out of money, being out of pocket, uh, I think protection, uh, customer protection, is a very important uh, factor now. And you know we just touched on uh, open banking, open banking payments at least, and uh, although wonderful and there are great use cases for that. I think where you have prepayments and there's uncertainty about the service actually being delivered. Um, there's currently no consumer protection built into that. So I think the banks still have to come up with a solution where uh, there is a distributor, a distribute possibility that the customer can actually claim their money back um, if they have booked directly with an airline, for instance. You know, if you're in the UK, if you book a package and you, you, you're protected by the consumer protection scheme, APTA, uh, but, but, not, um, but not with a direct booking. So uh, there are a lot of things there. And, and from an industry perspective, um, again, the, 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 the flow went into reverse um, and, and the liability with the acquirers um, you know, for those transactions, you know, in case they're not delivered um, and, and the transactions have not been refunded yet, it's with the acquirers. So uh, the acquiring community became very nervous about you know, their outstanding liabilities with uh, and all these parties that, 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 that deliver services in, in, in the future. And, and that's where now a lot of... Uh, uh, work is done to see okay, how can we uh, how can we manage that better than than we do uh, you know what we did before and I think a lot of a lot of the aspects were like you know this we were aware of it as an industry uh, but it was not broken so there was not really a priority to fix it. COVID broke a lot and and I think that will and I think it was mentioned before that will give us the opportunity to really take ourselves back to do a reset and to come up with innovations 
and, and, and let's say digital transformation that will make us better equipped you know, uh, for, for a sustainable ecosystem uh, towards the future. Uh, Paul, when we were talking in, in, in preparation, you mm -hmm. said that there are initiatives in the way to make these vouchers almost like an alternative payment method. So consumers can buy and sell them amongst each other. And I guess airlines can collateralize, collateralize them and sell them to, to get cash. Um, yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, I, I think first and foremost, the airlines uh, priority is to uh, keep the money on their own accounts. So, um, and uh, to, to, if, if uh, a flight gets canceled, that that money is, is spent to, uh, towards a, a future booking. Or you see some instances where uh, you can convert it to miles and, and, and use that, those for something else, but, or you can, spend, you can use them with a partner airline. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there will be uh, you know, innovative uh, business models coming up where uh, there, it is more likely, you know, more likely for the, the customer to accept that voucher because that's always better from an airline perspective than, than issuing a refund. Because then it's, it's likely that they'll use that money for something completely else, uh, completely different or to book on a different airline. So that, that's the, the main priority. And um, yeah, looking forward to see what kind of business models will come out of that. Um, but again, as long as that money, um, you know, is if the service not rendered or is not converted to something tangible, uh, it's like let's say it's used, then the, the liability is still with the acquirer. So the acquirers are keeping a, you know, a very close eye on that to see what's happening with that, uh, that, that, that booking, with that voucher, when it's issued, when it's redeemed, and how can they, um, um, you know, monitor and measure their, their liability and, and, and keep also the banks behind them or uh, yeah, you know, uh, at ease. Yeah. Do you think this will have any impact on virtual cards, which was really on the rise? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, uh, if you see that um, uh, travel agencies typically uh, pay uh, airlines uh, either uh, through the IATA clearing system, which is kind of a you know, bill set billing settlement system, uh, or they use uh, virtual cards or the, or the cardholder, uh, the customer's card itself. But um, with the built-in protection for virtual cards, uh, it protects the travel agencies for, uh, you know, against bankruptcies of the suppliers uh, so that they can then instantly refund their customers and they can use the, you know, the regular a reversal process, the, the dispute management process to get their funds back. Uh, so that's, we see a, a significant growth in, in, in uh, for those booking that still take place eh, because the numbers are way, 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 way uh, down, but uh, the, the share of wallet for virtual cars is growing uh, to protect the travel agencies, but also to a certain degree to protect the airlines in case, you know, in that bill settlement plan, the, um, the, the travel agency in the end does not pay for uh, the booking, but the airline is, um, you know, under the, the IATA resolutions, they, they have to, uh, you know, to, to, to supply that service because that's one that, that, that needs to happen when you take a decision. Okay. We, we um, uh, taking a step from keeping the topic of virtual cards, but making the step to, uh, to B2B, uh, which is a new area where, where virtual cards are rising. Um, fast and instant B2B commerce. Angus, is, is that something you are seeing on the acceptance side or talking to companies? And you were alluding to that a little bit at the beginning and being both issuer and acquirer. Yeah, we're, we're, it's a really interesting one for us because um, we actually are, I guess, part owners of um, a solution which is right in the, the BNL, BNPL space. So buy now, pay later which as we all know is, is growing and growing and um, has seen a, a massive increase in growth during um, the COVID-19 pandemic anyway, uh, with consumers buying online, the ability to buy online, um, not only knowing that they can refund things, particularly in clothing, if they don't fit or the color's not quite right or whatever, um, but also to be able to buy it and not pay for it and send it back having basically paid either very little or nothing is a, is a massive advantage to a consumer. Um, and so it is a, a solution that we, uh, we have, it's called NUSA, N-O-O-S-A. Um, it's actually live uh, with a large uh, Italian retailer called OVS. Um, a very interesting solution which enables um, lending banks via API to integrate and become uh, lenders to consumers in real time, both in-store and online. In-store, it's completely contactless. 
um, and the uh, consumer then pays 25% um, using a, a, a card or card details, if you like, uh, which are uploaded onto the app. Um, they will then pay 25% at point of purchase, 25% uh, 30 days later, another 30 days later, and so on. So over, uh, over four months, they've paid the full amount. Now, what's really interesting about this is that the fastest way for us to efficiently make the payment or enable the payment to be made uh, from the bank to the retailer, who receives 100% upfront of that. So the bank is taking the risk, and this is what's, what's the, the joy to the consumer. Uh, the fastest way to do that is with a single use virtual card that we would issue, and that's paid straight out uh, in a business to business manner across to uh, the retailer who's enabling that consumer to make a payment. And what's for me, that's it sounds sad, doesn't it? It's really exciting. But um, so for, for me, for me, that's quite exciting because it does change these batch payments and where, you know, has, has something gone wrong with a batch and we've got to consolidate everything and we then have to try and reconcile. No, it's an individual payment. It goes straight across. The reference for the retailer can be quite simply reconciled against that payment if there's a refund or a part refund. But it speaks very much to what you were saying uh, earlier, Matt, about um, the Uber experience where you're embedding everything into that. And and, so, and I, I've said this uh, before, actually, on, a, on another panel not that long ago. It, it just strikes me. You know, I, I love payments, obviously. Hopefully, I wouldn't, wouldn't be doing this if I didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, even with my love of payments, I don't think I've ever walked out of a store or completed a purchase online and sort of gone to myself, oh, what an amazing payments experience. Because that's just not what you think of as a consumer you don't want an amazing payments experience you want a good experience and the payment should just be a part of that so you know where we are with with both acceptance and issuing of cards is enabling the consumer to do everything as easily as possible by what they want when they want how they want and and do the same for refunds um, and, and if that means um, giving a retailer the ability to issue cards, be they virtual, single use, or physical cards, or for us to be able to issue cards to enable payments uh, from business to business, then I, I think it's a really efficient way of, uh, of achieving that goal. So, so Angus, a question for you. Um, now the Uber experience is well known. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with the EBA introducing two-factor authentication, also the Uber experience, as long as you don't whitelist Uber, is also gone now because you have to uh, authenticate yourself, uh, you know, when you order a ride. So um, one way we want to make it as, as seamless as possible, the whole UX, and the other side we see that some people uh, are so afraid of the fraud component of, of accepting payments that they're trying to ruin it again. So what's your view on that? I think the, yeah, I, I'm completely with you, by the way. I, I think that, um, I think the SCA is, I was going to say in theory, then that's probably wrong of me to say that, it, you know, it, it does protect both the consumer and the uh, and the merchant or in my case, specifically the, the retailer or travel business for, for you, Paul. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's a classic case, possibly of our industry enforcing something which consumers are not necessarily ready for. And we haven't properly explained it. I mean, I if I go back to um, 3D Secure, it's not 3D Secure, um, uh, Chip and Pin. Um, you know, I, I remember years and years ago, it first came out, I was in a pub, I, I, this is before I lived in London, I was out in the country in the UK, and the publican who I w was getting to know relatively well, which is probably not a good sign, um, he just got his, his first device which enabled him to take chip and pin payments. And there's a guy at the bar, he's buying a beer, perfectly normal scenario, early in the evening, um, and the, the publican at the bar, he had screwed the terminal, the, the device, to his side of the bar. So he immediately asked the consumer for their credit card, put it into the machine and shouted across the bar, can I have your PIN number? <laughs> so, you know, and, and you think, well, this is a classic case of the cards and payments industry not clearly communicating to everybody how these technologies that we're putting out to consumers should be used. And I think, you know, there, there's always going to be faults with, with SCA, whether, whether it's um, uh, facial recognition, whether it's fingerprint, you know, whatever the, the, the method is, whether it's, um, you know, it, whether it's dual factor authentication and, oh, no, I've forgotten the login to my Gmail account where everything goes. I think it's all of this technology that we're, we're using to try and make things secure does require 
both us to educate and the consumer to get used to. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that necessarily answered your, your, your question, Paul, but I think there's oh, a bit well. It, it, it did make you think, though, about this case where I think it was also in the UK that someone told me once that uh, for snooker tables or pool tables in the US uh, yeah. that the, the coins were taken away, that you could only pay with a contactless card and yeah. that you, apparently you used to put a, a pound coin in there. It's your, to, your, it's your up next, right? Yeah. So that's also where there's a mismatch between day-to-day uh, -day behavior and, and payments. It was just a, a funny case there. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. That's a good example. Matt, any observations from your end? You, you, you guys work across a lot of different issuers and a lot of different business cases. Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting point on the SDA uh, thing just there. I think um, we the UX side of that and the, the impact on the customer, Angus is right, it has to catch up to where the regulator has, has put the, the hurdles in. And I think we... We risk, as we did with 3D Secure initially, turning customers off and, and actually making f things feel less secure than they, than they feel today. Um, and I do think it's, it's also the case with open banking that, I, and I, again, I think it was uh, Paul that mentioned it, where we don't have those safety rails in place. That, that exist on the more traditional form factors and, and we need to have those otherwise we risk pushing something out before it's ready having negative experiences at, uh, uh, at the customer level and that they, they're turned off of that and they don't get the, the tremendous benefits that are on offer through these things so I think it is it, it's a constant I think that most of the broadly the regulators have have done a better job recently than than 10 years ago in in trying to address the end customer rather than just trying to hammer american companies um but i i do think uh we it's on us in the industry to help bridge the gap between the consumer and that that regulation in a way that that um really adds value to them yeah, maybe it's good to stress indeed because I, I hear you saying uh, or using the word hurdle and, uh, and very often when talking about SCA, uh, friction is being thrown on the table because SCA is difficult and I think more and more and I think the, the regulation uh, and all the exemption uh, options uh, and the technologies that are, that are available do provide the options to, uh, to issuers to, uh, to create a compelling uh, UX but you must be able to do so. And a very nice example, I think, uh, I think most of us, that's my assumption at least, have done an, an Apple Pay transaction. Well, Apple Pay uh, clearly uses uh, SEA in an uh, EBI and RTS compliant uh, way. But I think if you ask the customer if they have experienced any friction when using Apple Pay, I don't think that they will say, yes, there was quite a lot of friction. Uh, although it's an RTS compliant and SEA uh, supported uh, solution. So it really comes down to more and more to creating and, and getting the, the, the right combination of regulation, exemptions, uh, SCA technologies, et cetera. And there are certainly ways to, to create compelling uh, customer experiences uh, there. Not always SCA has to mean hurdles, frictions, et cetera. As a, as a final thought, because we've kind of come to, towards the end of the, uh, of the webinar, any any thoughts on the SCA deadline? Will we make it? Will there be? I, I don't think there will be an extension, but will we see an extension? Will we see exemptions, perhaps, uh, like the Uber example? Any any thoughts from anyone? Well, that's a difficult question to answer in in, in general. <laughs> uh, when, when talking about exemptions, uh, uh, whitelisting was mentioned during this uh, uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, for example, American Express already uh, uses uh, whitelisting. Uh, they call it Express uh, List. So there are some first examples there in the uh, in the market. Yeah, uh, whether uh, everybody will will reach the deadline end of the year, and some countries uh, like the UK took the liberty indeed to to extend the deadline uh, already. Let's see. As ING, we are fully working on it and convinced that we can uh, meet the deadlines, but. It's hard to answer that uh, one in general, of course. Uh, true, uh, but yeah, it's a webinar, so we... Of course. Uh, <laughs> it's always <laughs> trying to, to go for the edge. Yeah. Matt, any, any thoughts? Uh, Michel, 
Michel, I think you're also, uh, in, in hindsight, the timing of ING launching Apple Pay in the Netherlands was quite fortunate. Fortunate for what? No, that, that you were ahead of the, <laughs> of, of, of the pandemic and that, that people had already, even still, had already a pay installed and had already used it. And now also they got boost you know, from the whole contact list. And I think that will help also the, uh, the adoption of uh, two-factor authentication uh, in general. Yeah, well, well, to an extent, uh, you, we, we, you can organize a separate webinar on, on big techs, uh, etc. But uh, on those aspects, we can learn on, on how they're looking at custom experience and what to bring uh, to the market, uh, indeed. And clearly, uh, Apple Pay uh, it brings a boost in, in uh, making people aware and uh, giving trust to people that they can use the smartphone for financial transactions uh, and payments. And not only now on Apple devices, but also on the, the other devices that we support in uh, not only the Netherlands, but on multiple markets, of course. Mm -hmm. I think just on the, on the, um, on the SCA uh, question there, Matthias, I think, well, I speak for the UK here, maybe, uh, maybe across here, I think it's um, unlikely that everybody will make it. Um, hugely unlikely. I also think having I was at a, a really uh, interesting retail event yesterday, actually, which was allowed to go ahead. Um, uh, quite why I'm not sure, but it's a licensed event. We were driving ridiculously fast race cars around a track, so it was very COVID-19 friendly, and you can imagine why that was an attractive event to go to. But when we weren't driving cars fast around a track, we were obviously talking about all these uh, things and problems. And you know, quite honestly, retailers. You know, SCA is almost the last thing they're thinking about. They've been beaten into the ground by COVID-19 and they're trying to do everything they can to, um, to, to, to get themselves back up. You know, they, they've been supported certainly in this country by the, by the furlough scheme, but that can't last forever. Um, all they want to do is, is uh, try and think about ways in which they can entice consumers back. Um, and I firmly believe that if we can as an industry help retailers and, and any business where a consumer wants to make a payment do that as, as easily as possible, um, then you know, we'll, we'll be much better off for it. Um, you know, yes, I think SCA um, will happen. I think it's going to happen at some point. I don't think it should be you know, an urgency for it to, to be completed on time, as it were. I think there are more important things in the world right now. All right. We, uh, I think with that, we, we come to the end of the, uh, of the webinar. I would like to thank all the participants and I would like to especially thank the uh, panelists for, uh, for taking part. Um, I browsed through the questions. We have not answered the questions directly, but I think through the talk track, we have actually answered most of the uh, questions. So many thanks. Um, thanks again for the attendees and see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Please connect on LinkedIn if you want to. That would be great. Yep. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.